This is the sound of your brain firing. My life's work has been to connect these brain waves to machines. Between your temples lies a machine more marvelous than anything else we know in the universe. Phil Kennedy's original research was pioneering. My short-term goal is to help people who are locked in to communicate. It gave him a reason to live. This had never been heard of before. What, you can control a device with a brain directly? He wanted to do something to stay a step ahead. I decided the best thing to do was to implant myself. He told me himself, and I said, you're kidding me, right? It's my brain, and I can do what I like with it. The biggest risk was that I might lose it all. I set about recording for myself, and we got signals. History will look at what Kennedy's done and say that was the start of something important. I think it's part of the evolution of the human race. The goal is implanting devices in humans. We will be able to decipher the contents of our minds, the contents of our thoughts, and manipulate them. Who gets the brain implant and who has the controller? This is frightening. The technology we're developing should be used to help people. Our brains still have immense potentialities. Right now, I look at it and I'm just beginning. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Breeze, Breezeway Productions' The Breeze, where we continue our coverage of this year's 2021 edition of the Tribeca Film Festival. And we're happy to have filmmaker David Burke all the way from Ireland here today on this Zoom call uh, to talk about his documentary, which is world premiering at the festival, The Father of the Cyborgs. How are you? A pleasure. Thanks for having me, Alex. For sure. Thanks for coming on the show. Tell me a little bit about The, uh, the Father of the Cyborgs. Um... When I was initially starting this project, I wanted to do something in bioengineering. It just made logical sense to me that there had to be interesting people in this field. And I just delved straight into it. And I just kept researching and looking at different areas. And I eventually came across Phil, Phil Kennedy's story. And it just, it hooked me immediately. I mean, a guy who self-experimented on his own brain, traveled to South America, put brain implants inside his own head. And it's like, wow, okay. Because I had that aha moment. You know, it, I just knew this was the story. That I want, and I wanted to know more about it. And the more I delved into it, the more I learned about the backstory of brain implants in the 50s and 60s. And there was all these really crazy, dubious experiments going on. So nowadays, with like people like Elon Musk getting involved in, in the very same field that Phil pioneered. And so I was hooked. I just knew there was something that I just knew I wanted to do a project on Phil if he, if he, if he was interested in it. And the thing that really sold it for me was that Phil was from town called Limerick, which is like a 25 minute drive from where I'm sitting now. So it was just, I mean, I just, I just had to reach out to him and th that's how it started. Yeah. Uh, so he's been doing this research for a very long time. Uh, he said that when it started, I think they showed some, some archival footage of how big the computers were. Uh, he went over to like the, the museum of computers to show where it started and he brought out some blueprints and you could see how excited he was. Um, in the last couple of years or so, how much farther has this uh, research gone with the leaps and bounds of technology helping enhance his work? It's, it's interesting. It's some, one of the things that really struck me with this, uh, the bridge is broader topic of this field was that like a lot of the conversations we were having in the 50s and 60s, they're kind of still the same conversations we're having now. You know what I mean? It's, it, we're still on about taking broad signals from the brain to do broad things. Now, the, for example, you can move robotic hands now, say, purely from signals from your brain. Now, the movements has got way more refined, and you can even have sensors now in it that the, you can actually, these robotic hands feel as well, you know what I mean? So it's, it's getting advanced, but regards science fiction, for example, which is what they're kind of this side of the story that fascinates people, I don't think we're, I don't think you and I need to worry about our downloading brains just yet, you know? Okay. And, I mean, there is some amazing research being done. There's so many Columbia University that wants to, um, you know, re restore sight about stimulating the visual cortex. It's, there is really interesting stuff going on. There's uh, Eddie Chang in California. He, he's doing something similar to Phil, where he's basically 
you know, he, he can get words just by patient who can't talk, who he's locked in, but just getting them to think about words, he can get them to, no, it's not perfect, but they can talk, you know what I mean? They can get certain words out, which is a massive leap forward. What Phil, the thing is with some of this research is that the longevity of the implants isn't guaranteed yet. So that's a big thing. Yeah, that, that they'll be working on it. He's He's been working on it for so long and had uh, a great array of people that have joined him along his journey. And you could you could sense that this is this is what he's doing. And uh, I really liked when you went back to the, the first cyborg or when you documented the case of when the patient was in the bed, but he had, I, I believe, a full stroke. And then he was able to spell out his name and you visited the grave and then you went on to... Um, the other, the the kid that was in a, an accident, and then how right. his, you know, went and it proceeded. So you're really going through all of these these cyborgs, which is basically implanting in the brain. And then he did it within himself, which is wild. How many cyborgs do you believe, in the, in the term of the sense, are around today? Is there a large population of people that are that utilize this technology, or not really? Yeah, I mean, think about it. I mean, there are loads of people. I mean, the. DARPA, for example, have got heavily into brain computer interface and for soldiers coming back from certain wars, you know, that have lost limbs, you know, they're cyborgs. One of the things that I fascinated me about this was that you and I are cyborgs because, you know, are, are, we, are we already, are we, are we not merged with technology already? The, the, the example that, that, I, that I always use is there was a um, story about Socrates. If we go back thousands of years of philosopher, he didn't like writing because he felt that it was going to affect his memory. So, which and technically is right because you know what I mean. You're 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 actually putting words down on a page to save yourself from memorizing. It's the same. With, I used to remember all four, my friends' phone numbers years ago. Now I don't remember any of them. They're all on the phone. Yeah. So we've already yeah. started this this conversation emerging technology is thousands of years old. It's not new. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was pretty interesting where you showcased the past. Uh, history of, you know, just uh, electroshock therapy and other different things that were kind of eerie um, within medical history. And now you're looking towards the future. I agree that we definitely have a sense of cyborgness to us. I mean, from like Oculus VR, uh, movies like Ready Player One, which ta talks about moving, living in a game. Uh, exactly. uh, one, one thing I really loved about it was uh, the music. So when your composer it was very eerie, very sci-fi-ish, very, very creepy when you were introducing it. So how did um, I wanted to ask about the music and how, did you, how you linked up with your composer? So that that was a really great aspect of it. Yeah, I just researched uh, composers. And again, it was almost like Phil. I was surprised that the composer that I was really interested in lived pretty close to me. He, he had worked on previous documentaries that had been Sundance, for example, and he had He's an artist, he's a, he's a musician in his own right. So he kind of, you know, he dips in, into different fields. But yeah, the music, I think he did a fantastic job. I yeah. Simon yeah. O'Reilly is a composer. He really did, uh, he's just, he really is fantastic. And I asked him, I remember I asked him for something unusual. You know, you, you know a Thurman, that really kind of unusual, it's like, a, it's almost like a steel bar and you can move your hands in and out and make kind of eerie noises. I asked him like, any chance you get a thermal? And he was like, oh yeah, I got sampled one of them a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you can totally do a you can get a thermal in it. So yeah, I mean, he's just has a really great depth of knowledge and music and again kind of more nuanced than usual stuff so i think he did a really great job to be honest. i i think so as well i think that the film overall was very fascinating i learned a lot watching it uh very scientific very precise uh, the doctor has done great work uh over the course of his life in helping people that have been paralyzed or they lose function within their body and then they stimulate a being able to do things within implants of the brain, including himself, which is, you know, the, the biggest leap to be able to do that. Uh, and your world premiering this year at the Tribeca Film Festival. In closing, is there anything you'd like to say to the Tribeca Film Festival organization? Yeah, I mean, and I think Tribeca and the Alpha Peace Zone Foundation as well, who funded it and who are organizing the screening as, as well. I think when we started this project, Phil and I, four years ago, it wasn't even Plan A, where I wouldn't have even, we were scared to even say plan A would have been Tribeca, but the, the dream of Tribeca. So it's just, it's just fantastic to be screening there. It's really just the best thing possible that could have happened for the film. And I hope, you know, I think Phil deserves kind of a lap of honor for all his research and work. So, you know, it's, it's delighted that he's going to get it at Tribeca. Yeah, well, we thank the good doctor for for what he's been doing with this research that is helping give some parents some relief. Uh, I believe one of the parents said that he was thankful for this uh, technology because it gave his child a reason to live. 
you know, that, that kind of hit heavy here. So obviously this research is very needed for people that are suffering this debilitating issue. And uh, also for your world premiere and your directorial debut, great start. And uh, I wanted to thank you for, for spending some time to talk with me today on The Breeze. And we hope that our audience checks out The Father of the Cyborgs. Pleasure. Thank you very much.